Hello, this is Matt Dean with A Plus College Ready, and today we're going to work some problems dealing with work, power, and energy. Start off with question one. You lift straight up a four kilogram box to a height of two meters above the ground. The box moves at a constant velocity for the entire displacement. How much work did you do on the box? Key point is this term constant velocity. That tells you that there's no net force acting on the object which means you're lifting so we'll call that your lift force, we'll call it an applied force you're lifting with a force that's equal but opposite to the weight or the force of gravity so there's no net force acting on the box um, the work done by you is going to be equal to force times distance times the cosine of theta where theta is the angle between the direction of the displacement and the direction of the force that's causing that work to happen. Well, in this case, the displacement's going to be straight up. You're lifting straight up, so the angle uh, is zero. So we'll have work equals the force. The force here has to be the weight, not the mass. So you need to take 4 kilograms times 9.81 meters per second squared. You end up with a force of 39.2 newtons up. You're moving this box a distance of 2 meters, also up, times the cosine of 0. Cosine of 0 is 1. So you do the math, 39.2 times 2 times the cosine of 0. You end up with a work done of 78.4 joules, and it's positive because the cosine of zero is positive one. The work you're doing is in the same direction of motion. Work is positive. Here's question two. Very much similar problem. This time though, you're asking for how much work did the gravitational force do? So you're doing work on the box. Gravity's also doing work on the box. We're gonna calculate that work the same way. FD cosine theta. Again, we know there's no net force. So the force being applied to the box by the Earth, in this case by gravity, is still 39.2 newtons. The box is still moving two meters. But this time, the angle between the displacement and the force is 180 degrees. The cosine of 180 is negative one. So therefore, when you do the math, 39.2, times 2 meters times the cosine of 180 you end up with a work done of negative 78.4 joules typically when something is moving in the opposite direction of the displacement or of, of the force rather the work is going to be negative work all right here's question three You lift straight up again, a four kilogram box to a height of two meters. The box moved at a constant velocity for the entire displacement. How much net work was done on the box? Well, since there's no net force, there can be no net work. Because we could calculate net work this way. We could say the net work is equal to the net force times the distance times the cosine of theta. Well, the net force is zero. So therefore, the work done is zero. We know that because we also know that work is equal to change in kinetic energy. And in this case, since there's a constant velocity, the kinetic energy change is zero. Therefore, the net work done is zero. And I think I just got ahead of myself. It says you lift a four kilogram box to a height of two meters above the ground. The box moved at a constant velocity for the entire displacement. But how much did the speed of the box change during the displacement? Again, since there's no net force, there's no net work. And again, remember that net work equals change in kinetic energy. This is zero. Therefore, the change in kinetic energy is zero. And we know that kinetic energy is one half mv squared. Well, the mass can't change. In this case, the velocity can't change either because there's zero change in kinetic energy. 
All right, now we get to something a little different, problem number five. In this case, we're pulling a uh, can, trash can, across a flat surface. We've got a rope hook up, hooked up to it. We're pulling on that rope with 50 newtons of applied force to the right. There's some friction acting uh, 30 newtons between the surface and the trash can. We pull it for 10 meters. We want to draw a free body diagram that depicts all the forces. So let's do that down here. So we're applying a force of 50 newtons to the right. That's our FA, that's our applied force. We know that friction always acts in the opposite direction of motion. It's going to be our frictional force. We'll label that F, F. We know that this arrow for friction is going to be less than the applied force arrow. And we know that it needs to be shorter because the frictional force is only 30 newtons, whereas the applied force is 50 newtons. We have weight acting down. Since we're on a nice flat surface, that's going to be balanced out by an equal but opposite force. And we'll label that as Fn acting up, the normal force. So those are our four forces acting on the box. In this case, the 10 meters doesn't matter. It's not a force, it's a distance. So now let's move on to problem number six. Here's problem six. This time we want to know how much work is done by the applied force. Well, again, we go to work equals FD cosine theta. Well, the applied force is 50 newtons. It's moving the box 10 meters. And it's moving the box in the same direction as the force. Therefore, the angle between the force and the displacement is zero. So cosine of zero. Remember, the cosine of zero is just one. So when we multiply this out, the work comes out to be 500 uh, newton meters or 500 joules, which is B. Problem seven, a very similar problem. This time we want to know how much work was done by the frictional force. Well, the frictional force is acting in the opposite direction of the motion. Again, we'll go to work equals FD cosine theta. The frictional force is 30 newtons. The distance is still 10 meters. But this time the angle between the displacement and the frictional force is 180 degrees in the opposite direction. Remember that the cosine of 180 degrees, or the cosine of 180, is negative 1. So when we do the math here, we end up with negative 300 newton meters, or joules. So we're looking at answer C is the correct answer. Let's go to problem 8. And guys, I'm going to go back and revisit problem 8 for a second. I just completely misread the problem. I read this as how much network was done by... On the, on the trash can. It's not what question 8 says. It asks how much work was done by the gravitational force. We're going to work that pretty much like we just did with the, um, with the net force problem. So we're going to use work equals FD cosine theta. Remember the force of gravity is going to be the weight of the object which was 39.2 newtons. The distance moved 10 meters, but the gravity force is acting at an angle of 270 degrees um, away from the angle of displacement. So this is going to be times the cosine of 270, and the cosine of 270 is zero. So we get zero network done by the gravitational force, and then again in question nine we got. Next question, question nine, wants to know how much work was done by the normal force on the trash can. Well, the normal force, remember, since we're on a flat surface, is going to be equal but opposite to the weight. So let's take the mass, four kilograms, multiply that by G, 9.81.
get a weight of 39.24 newtons. Well, that weight, since we're on flat ground, is also going to be equal but opposite to the normal force. Well, if we calculate work, work equals force, 39.24 newtons, times distance, 10 meters. But in this case, the normal force is acting at a 90 degrees above the, uh, the displacement, above the direction of the displacement. So this is going to be times the cosine of 90. Well, the cosine of 90 is zero, which means the work done by the normal force, and also in this case, the work done by gravity, both of those are equal to zero. Zero net work done by the normal force. Question 10 is the one that asks for the net work. And remember that net work we could think of it as equal to net force times distance times cosine of theta. Or we could take the work done by the uh, applied force, which was 500 newtons, minus the work done by frictional force in the opposite direction of 300 newtons to end up, and I keep saying newtons, but joules, these should be joules, to end up with 200 joules. <clears throat> If we use this equation, the net force is 20 newtons, the distance is 10 meters, the angle between the displacement and the net force is zero. Calculate that out and we still end up with 200 joules of net work done on this object. Here's question 11. If we assume the initial speed of the chem was zero, what is its speed after traveling 10 meters, the 10 meters described above? Well, you gotta remember that the net work is equal to the change in kinetic energy. So we did 200 joules of net work, and that's got to equal to the change in kinetic energy. In this case, it's gotta equal the final kinetic energy since we started off with zero kinetic energy. So one half mv square. Do a little work here. Go ahead and plug in the mass. The mass of our can was four kilograms. All right. If we solve that out for um, for v, go ahead and do the algebra. Solve for v. V comes out to be ten meters per second. So in this case, the work we did caused an increase in speed, which in turn caused an increase in the kinetic energy of the can. All right, here's question 12. So in this case, we have a bike rider. He and his bike have a combined mass of 90 kilograms. The rider starts from rest and rolls down an incline plane 500 meters long. So we're saying the length of this leg is 500 meters. The angle of incline, this angle right in here, is five degrees. And we have a frictional force acting at 60 newtons. And we wanna find the speed of the biker at the bottom of the hill. We also know the combined mass of the biker and the bike, 90 kilograms. All right, there's several ways we could do this problem, but let's, let's stick with an energy approach here. Let's first of all draw this hill out as if it were a triangle, and let's use the fact that the hypotenuse of this triangle is 500, and this angle is five, and let's calculate the height. So we're gonna use the sine function, and we're gonna say that the sine of five degrees is equal to the opposite side, which we'll just call y in this case, over the hypotenuse of 500. So if we solve that out, sine of 5 times 500, we get a height of about 43.6 meters. Now we can use that height, 43.6 meters, to calculate the amount of gravitational potential energy that the biker and the bike have at the top of the hill. Remember, we use that 
uh, MGH, some people write, some people write MG delta Y. So to calculate the gravitational potential energy, let's take the mass, 90 kilograms, times G, times the height, which in this case is 43.6 meters. If we multiply that out, that ends up giving us an initial amount of a gravitational potential energy of 38,000. 38,494 joules. So that's how much potential energy the biker and the bike have at the top of the hill. Well, if there weren't any friction, as the bike rolled down the hill at the bottom of the hill, all of that potential energy would become, um, would become kinetic. So the change in potential would equal the change in kinetic. But in this case, there's friction. Friction is doing negative work, which means it's canceling out some of that gravitational potential energy. So let's calculate the amount of work done by the frictional force. So what we know is that we know work equals Fd cosine theta. The frictional force was 60 newtons. The bike is moving a distance of 500 meters down the incline. And in this case, the angle between the displacement and the direction of the frictional force, they're in completely opposite directions. So that's 180 degrees. We do the math here. We end up with a work of 30,000, negative 30,000 newtons. So this negative 30,000 newtons cancels out 30,000 of our original potential energy, which leaves us with only 8,494 joules of energy that become kinetic. So by the time he gets to the bottom of the hill, the rider has an amount of kinetic energy equal to 8,494 joules. We can set that equal to one half mv squared. Uh, plug in 90 for the mass. And then solve that out for V. And when we do get that solved out for V, we get a velocity of 13.7 meters per second. So again, the, the rider's potential energy, part of it was canceled out by the negative work done by friction. Some of that energy was turned to heat. What was left was 8,494 joules of energy that were converted to kinetic energy. We set that equal to one half mv square, solve for v, get 13.7 meters per second. All right, here's problem 13. A box slides down a frictionless incline plane of length 10 meters. The plane is inclined at an angle of 20 degrees above the ground. If the box starts from rest, what is its speed at the bottom of the incline plane? It's a very similar problem to the last one. So our incline plane is length 10 meters. Our angle of incline is 20 degrees. We're not given a mass here, and that throws a lot of people off. But since there's no friction, we can say that the amount of gravitational potential energy that we start off with at the top of the plane is equal to the kinetic energy at the bottom of the plane. Well, we know that gravitational potential energy is equal to mg delta y or mgh and we know that the kinetic energy is one half one half mv squared. As I hope you can see, the masses cancel out here. We don't need to know the mass. We're trying to find the speed at the bottom of the hill. So let's take this equation right here. Let's solve that for V. So we're going to need to multiply both sides by 2 to get rid of that 1 half. So that's going to give us 2G delta Y is equal to V squared. We're going to take the square root of both sides. 
So our speed is equal to the square root of 2g delta y. Well, we know what g is, 9.81. We know what delta y is. Actually, we need to find delta y because delta y is going to be the height. So to find that height, we need to use the sine function. And we're going to say the sine of 20, we'll call this y, equals opposite of y over the hypotenuse of 10. So that gives us a height of 3.42 meters. So then we plug into our equation up top here. So we're going to say that speed equals the square root of 2 times g times delta y, which is 3.42. Take the square root of that whole quantity, and we end up with a speed of 8.19 meters per second at the bottom of the hill. In this case, since there was no friction, all of the gravitational potential energy at the top of the plane was converted to kinetic energy by the time the box reached the bottom of the plane. All right, let's pick up with question 14. So a crate of mass M sits at rest at the top of an incline that has an that is at an angle of theta with a horizontal. The crate has a height of H and a length of L. We're talking about the length of the incline plane is L here. The block is released and slides down the ramp. So there is friction in this problem. And the coefficient of friction is mu. Which of the following represents the kinetic energy of the box at the bottom of the ramp? All right, so let's assume first of all that there was no friction. We start out up here with some um, gravitational potential energy, mgh. And if there was no friction at the bottom, all of that gravitational potential energy would be kinetic energy. Um, so the kinetic energy at the bottom would be mgh. But in this case, friction is doing some, some work on the box and it's doing negative work in this case and it's dissipating some of that energy. Uh, because of the, the frictional heat that's that, that's made. So we first of all need to figure out how much work is done by friction. And to do that, first thing we're going to do is take the weight. We're going to draw it in. Draw it in straight down like that. And then we're going to break that weight into a component perpendicular and a component parallel with that plane. This is the weight. So this is mg. This angle right here is theta. So this side right here is going to be the, um, the perpendicular component of the weight, which is also going to be equal to the, um, the normal force. So to calculate that, we're going to use the cosine. And we're going to say the cosine of theta is equal to uh, adjacent, which right now we're just going to, well, I'm just going to go ahead and call that Fn over um, hypotenuse, which is mg. So Fn equals mg cosine theta. Remember that our frictional force is equal to mu times n. So our frictional force is going to be equal to mu times mg cosine theta. We're not just trying to find the frictional force, we're trying to find the work done by friction. We know that work is force times distance. So in this case, the work done by friction is going to be the force, mu mg cosine theta, times the distance, which is the length of the plane, L. So that's the work done by friction. And that's going to end up being negative work uh, because it's dissipating the energy. So our, our total, um, total energy, total kinetic energy at the bottom of the ramp is going to be A, MGH, the initial potential energy, minus um, the work done by friction, which is gonna be mu mg cosine theta times L. Here they have it in a slightly different order, but same thing. All right, that's question 14. Here's question 15. A cylinder with an initial velocity of zero is released from the top of a ramp as shown above. The ramp has a height of h 
and the cylinder rolls down the route without slipping. At the bottom of the ramp, the cylinder makes a smooth transition to a small section of a horizontal table and then travels over the edge at a height of H above the floor, eventually landing on the floor at a horizontal distance L from the table. As the cylinder rolls down the ramp, how do the potential energy of the cylinder earth system and the kinetic energy of the cylinder change? All right, so here's, here's what we've got to think about. As this thing goes down this plane, its height is getting less. Well, we know that gravitational potential energy is mgh. So as h goes down, gravitational potential energy is going to go down. And as it goes down the hill, it's building up speed. Um, and we know that kinetic energy is one half mv squared. So the higher that speed gets, the higher the kinetic energy gets. So it's looking like our potential energy is going to decrease, our kinetic energy is going to increase, and that looks like question or choice B on number 15. All right, so 16 looks at the same, um, same problem essentially. So refer back to problem 15, after, after the cylinder leaves the table, but before it lands, how do the translational kinetic energy and the rotational kinetic energy of the cylinder change. All right, so let's look back at the picture. So as the cylinder comes off this edge here, now we've got a gravi gravity um, acting on it, and that's gonna increase <clears throat> its translational kinetic energy. But there's no force to, to cause a torque on this, a net torque. So since there's no net torque, um, the rotation is not going to change. So since the rotation is not changing, but the linear speed is changing, it's looking like choice D is going to be our correct answer here. And that one says that uh, the rotational kinetic energy stays the same. There's no net torque, but the translational kinetic energy increases because the speed is going to increase. All right, here's 17. So this one's a pendulum. So we've got a one kilogram pendulum bob. Um, it's raised to a height of 1.2 meters above the floor as shown over here. And the bob is then released from rest. When the bob is one meter above the floor, how much kinetic energy does it have? Well, we know that uh, it starts off when it's raised to that one meter height with um, gravitational potential energy, mgh. Um, and we could calculate that. So we could go uh, one kilogram times 10 meters per second square times 1.2 meters. So we're gonna start off with 12 joules of kinetic energy. All right. Then this thing's released and it eventually falls down so that now it's only one meter above the ground. So again, let's calculate mgh. One kilogram times 10 meters per second square times a height of one meter. So now we have 10 joules of, of um, gravitational potential energy. We started with 12, now we have 10. Assuming there's no friction here, that means that two has now been converted to kinetic energy. Um, so our answer looks like C, two joules of kinetic energy because some of that initial potential energy is converted to kinetic, kinetic as this pendulum bob moves toward the equilibrium position. All right, that's 17. Let's move on and look at question 18. So a rock is released from 800 meters above the ground. Due to the combined forces of air resistance and gravity, it has a speed of 60 meters per second when it reaches the ground. What percentage of the initial mechanical energy of the rock earth system was dissipated due to air resistance? Take the potential energy of the rock to be zero when the rock reaches the ground. All right, so first of all, we're starting off when that rock is released with, um, with gravitational potential energy. So let's calculate how much energy we started with. We know that's mgh. Um, we don't know the mass, but we know g, and we know h. 
something like that. All right. When it hits the ground, we know that it has all kinetic energy. All that potential is converted to kinetic. And we know that kinetic energy is one half mv squared. But again, we don't know the mass, but we do know the speed, 60. So let's do this. Typically, if we were trying to find the um, uh, amount of energy dissipated, we could take the uh, amount that we ended up with, which is this, divided by the amount we started with, which is that. So let's take one half m v squared. And let's divide that by mgh. All right, notice that the masses cancel out here. So let's go one half times um, 60 to get 30. Oops, sorry. That's 60 squared, so 3,600 on top times a half would be 1,800. And then on the bottom, we're going to be 10 times 800. We're going to be 8,000 on the bottom. Notice our units are the same on top and bottom. They're going to cancel. So let's go 1,800 divided by 8,000. And that's going to give us 0.225. Well, let's convert that to a percentage. So 22.5% of the energy is left when we get to the bottom. That means that 100 minus 22.5 was dissipated. And that gives us 77.5% of our energy dissipated by things like drag mostly as this thing falls. So choice B looks like a good answer here. All right, so here's problem number 19. A rock of mass M is launched at a 45 degree angle above the horizontal ground. It reaches a maximum height of H after being launched. At the instant the rock returns to its initial height, what is the value of the work done on the rock by the gravitational force? Um, here's the deal. When it's back to its original height, so it, start, it started off at some speed, it's going to leave with some speed and it's going to go up. And then it's going to, when it gets back down, it's going to be at the same speed it was when it left, assuming there's no friction. Because it has the same speed, that means here and here, it has the same amount of kinetic energy. That means there's no net work done on this rock. That means choice A is our correct answer on number 19. Kinetic energy didn't change, therefore there was no network done. All right, here's question 20. So two identical smart carts, smart cart A and B, move toward each other at different speeds on a horizontal surface, no friction. The objects then collide elastically and move away from each other. If cart A had 40 joules of kinetic energy before the collision, and 60 joules after the collision, which of the following is true of cart B? Key here is this is an elastic collision. And we know in elastic collisions, both um, momentum and kinetic energy are conserved. So cart A started with 40 joules, but it ended up with 60 joules. It gained 20 joules of energy. We know that the kinetic energy for the system has to be conserved since this is an elastic collision. So if A is gaining energy, B must be losing energy and therefore slowing down. So it's looking like choice C has to be right. Again, this is because it's an elastic collision and um, kinetic energy is conserved in these elastic collisions. All right, here's question number 21. So here we get an energy bar chart and we're asked to pick two choices. Notice what we're starting off with here. So we're starting off with gravitational potential energy. 
and we've got one, two, three, four, five units of gravitational potential energy. Notice that from A to B, something converts that all of that gravitational potential energy to kinetic energy, because over here we have five units of kinetic energy. Notice from B to C, from B, um, from B to C, there's some work done. And notice that there's five units of work, but notice that it's negative five units of work so that we, when we end up, we end up with no, uh, no mechanical energy. So A to B, something's converting potential to kinetic. Uh, and then B to C, something's taking that kinetic and doing work on it and dissipating that kinetic energy so that we're left with nine. So if we look at our potential choices, it's looking like, um, we'll take a look at choice B, an object at the top of an incline plane, negligible friction between the object and the incline is released and it slides down the ramp. So that would convert all that potential to kinetic. That part makes sense. At the bottom of the ramp, the object continues to slide across a horizontal surface with significant friction. So now there's friction. That friction is doing work, negative work, and eventually the object stops moving, which means it no longer has kinetic energy. So B looks like a good answer. Notice though, this is one of these choose two answer choices. So now if we go down and we look at choice um, D, I think we're gonna find that's our other correct answer. I'm not sure what I did there. Let's see if I can get that back. There we go. Let's move this out of the way. So choice D, a baseball is dropped from a significant height. So starting with potential, as it's falling, that potential is converted to kinetic. The ball then hits an airbag. So that airbag is going to be pushing up on it, um, doing negative work, work against where it's falling and slowly deflates until the ball reaches ground level and stops moving. So again, that looks like a good choice. So I'm thinking D, B and D on question number 21. Energy bar charts. You're gonna see some kind of energy bar chart on pretty much every AP Physics 1 exam. So here's question 22. The graphs on the right show the magnitude F of a force exerted on an object as a function of the object's position. So we've got force versus position graphs. Um, work one and work two, W1 and W2, are the work done on the objects by force one and two. How do work one, W1, and W2 compare and why? What you've got to remember when you have a force times position graph is that the area under this curve is equal to the work done. And if you just look at the curves, this area is much greater than this area. So that's telling me that W1 is greater than W2. Um, and it's looking like that being the case, C is probably our best answer here. The area under force curve two is less than the area under force curve one. Force position graphs, area under the curve is work. Uh, make sure you know that because it's gonna be on every, every exam. All right, let's look at question number 23. So a ball with a mass of 0.4 kilograms is dropped vertically from a height of two meters above the ground. The ball bounces off the ground and during the bounce, two joules of energy is dissipated. What's the maximum height the ball can reach after the bounce? So let's first of all figure out how much energy we're starting with. We're starting with gravitational potential energy, mgh. So that would be 0.4 times 10 times 2. So let's see, that would be uh, 4, 8 joules of gravitational potential energy. But we're losing 2 during the bounce which means on the way up, now we only have six left. So that, that ball is gonna come down. It's gonna hit with eight joules of kinetic energy right here. Two of those are lost. On the way up, it starts with six joules of kinetic energy. And eventually up here, 
we should have um, all that six should be converted to to potential. So our maximum amount of energy at the top is going to be six joules. So now let's go again, mu equals mgh. This time, let's set six joules equal to our mass times gravity. And this time, let's just solve for that height. So we're going to end up with six divided by four. So we're going to end up with one and a half meters. That's as high as that ball can go because of that energy that's lost um, during that bounce. All right, that's it for 23. Let's move on and look at 24. So in 24, a crate slides down an incline with a friction between the crate and the incline. No air resistance. Which of the following correctly describes the resulting change in energy of the earth, um, should say crate system, earth crate system. Um, so since we have friction, let's just, let's draw a picture here to begin with. So we start off up here we have uh, gravitational potential energy. As this thing slides, some of that energy is converted to kinetic energy. But along the way, there's also friction and friction is dissipating some of that energy as heat, thermal energy. So that being said, it's looking like choice B is our best answer here. So the sum of the kinetic energy and the gravitational potential energy changes by an amount equal to the energy dissipated by friction. With no friction, the amount of gravitational potential energy we started out with up here would be the same as the amount of kinetic energy we have at the bottom of that incline. It's not in this case because friction does work and dissipates some of that energy. And that's really what B is telling us. All right, let's move ahead and look at question 25. So here we have a mover. And the mover is moving a heavy um, crate. Let me rearrange my screen a bit here. Um, from ground level to the top of a platform as shown in the pictures. In figure one, he uses a, an incline with no friction to do that. And in figure two, he just lifts it up and puts it on the top of the platform. In which case does the mover do more work on the crate and why? Well, remember that work force and distance. So obviously in figure one, he's having to move this thing a longer distance than he is here in figure two. But because of the incline plane, the force is going to be less. Um, so here there's going to be a bigger force, smaller distance. Here, there's gonna be a smaller force, but a bigger distance. Point being though, since there's no friction, when the, 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 the product of these two is the same, the work is the same. Now in the real world, there would be friction here. So this guy would end up doing more work than this guy does. But in this problem, since there's no friction, the amount of work done in both situations is the same. And that gives us choice D, as our answer, uh, neither method, the work is the same in both cases. So let's move ahead and look at number 26. 26, we've got a graph. And this is one of those uh, force versus position graphs. And remember that the area under the curve here is the work. Um, so here it says a smart cart is moving along a level track in the positive x direction. A force acting parallel to the x axis is exerted on the cart. The graph shows the net force exerted on the cart as a function of position. As the cart travels from zero to six meters, what is the net change in the kinetic energy of the cart? All right, so what we've got to think about first of all is we know that work, oops, work is equal to change in kinetic energy. So let's first of all calculate the work. So from zero to two meters, 
we're going to calculate the area under this curve. So we have a rectangle that's two wide, two units wide, two meters wide, and 40 newtons tall. We know that for a rectangle, um, length times width will give us the area. So this area is going to turn out to be 80 newton meters or 80 joules. And that's positive because it's above the x-axis. Well, down here between two and six, we've got a length that's our force, and that's negative 20 newtons. And our length is uh, four meters. So length times width, negative 20 times four, negative 80 joules. So we have negative 80 joules here, positive 80 joules here. Sum those up, we have zero network and therefore we're gonna have zero change in kinetic energy. So it's looking like choice B, no net change in kinetic energy is our best answer here. Again, make sure that you know that the area under force position curve um, is work, network. All right, let's look at number 27, another graph. So this one says the graph above shows the force exerted by a spring is a function of the length of a spring. A block on a table with negligible friction is pushed against the spring that is fastened to the wall. The spring is compressed until its length is 40 centimeters. The block is then released. Which of the following values is the closest to the kinetic energy with which the block leaves the spring? So, Notice this is 0.4 meters, that's 40 centimeters. So here's when it's compressed. Um, we let it go and it stretches back out to 0.8. Um, point being, we, we first of all can calculate our, um, our spring constant. We know that F equals Kx. Sometimes you see it as negative kx. Um, and k, therefore, is equal to f over x. So notice that 0.4 meters, 40 centimeters, the force is about 50 newtons. And that's when we compress this thing um, by 0.4 meters, from 0.8 to 0.4. Calculate out a K. Um, K is equal to 125 newtons per meter. We know that when this thing is compressed, that all the energy stored in it is elastic potential energy, which we can calculate this way, one half Kx squared. So one half K, 125 newtons per meter, times X, which is our displacement of our spring, 0.4 meters squared. Um, calculate that out. Um, that comes up to be 10 joules of elastic potential energy. Assuming no friction, which our problem tells me we have, that elastic potential is all gonna get converted to kinetic energy when that spring stretches back out to its normal length. So our answer here is gonna be B. Uh, our elastic potential is converted to kinetic, and that's 10 joules. All right, let's look at problem 28. A constant frictional force is applied continuously to a box initially moving at a speed V across a horizontal surface. The box moves for equal distances, D1 to D2, so it moves from here to here, and then it moves from here to here, and those distances are the same. How does the kinetic energy lost by the box over distance interval D2 compared to the kinetic energy lost over distance interval D1 and why? We know we're losing energy here because of the work done by friction. And we know that work is equal to change in kinetic energy. Some of you would probably be tempted to say that more energy is lost here because this thing starts out moving pretty fast. And so even slower by the time it gets over here. But what you've got to think about is what's doing the work. And the thing doing the work is the friction. And it tells us that it's a constant frictional force. 
So that means the work is that frictional force times the distance over which it acts. This is constant. The problem also told us that these Ds are the same for D1 and D2, which means the work done in from here to here is the same as the work done from here to here, which means that the change in kinetic energy is the same in both of those intervals. And that tells us therefore that B has to be the best answer. All right, so that leads us to 29. Here we've got a graph, but notice here the graph is velocity against time. It's not force against displacement. It says a box experiences a varying net force that changes its velocity. The graph shows the velocity of the box as a function of time. Which of the following correctly describes the net work done on the box for the given intervals of time? So looking like it's dividing it between zero and 30, 30 and 40, and um, 40 and 50. So let's look from zero to 30. So we start with a speed of zero. We end with a speed of zero, which means we start with kinetic energy zero. We end with kinetic energy zero, which means from, um, from zero to 30, we have zero network. All right, from here to here, we start off here with again k equals zero, but down here we have we have a pod, we're gonna end up with a positive k value. Even though our speed is negative, our velocity is negative, remember that this is one half mv squared. Well, this squared, that sign of that speed doesn't really matter. We're going to end up with a positive kinetic energy, um, which means that work has to be positive. And then from here to here, notice that our speed is getting less. Speed is slowing from 40 to zero. And because the speed is getting less, that means the work has to be negative. So that being said, it's looking like um, choice D here is a best answer. And let's look at what D says. From, from zero to 30, network is zero. Between 30 and 40, the work is greater than zero, it's positive. And between 40 and 50, the work is less than zero. You've got to think about the speed. Because of that one half mv squared, doesn't matter if that speed's positive or negative. What matters is the magnitude of that velocity. All right, so let's move ahead and look at number 31. Another graph. Sorry, number 30. Did I get my numbers wrong? Yep, number 30. Um, the graph above shows the potential energy of a system as one object in the system moves um, along the x-axis. And the rest of the system does not move. At point A, the object is moving in the positive x direction and the mechanical energy of the system is 11 joules. Now remember, this graph is only showing us potential energy. We're starting here at point A, right here, with 11 joules of mechanical energy. Six of those joules are um, potential, and that means the other five are kinetic. It says, as the object moves, no energy enters or leaves the system. So mechanical energy is conserved. What is the kinetic energy of the object at point C? So notice right here at point C, we have three joules of potential energy, but we know we have 11 total joules of mechanical energy Therefore, the other eight have to be kinetic. So C looks like our best answer on this one. So let's look at 31. So here we have um, an 800 kilogram um, truck with a driver. It's on a straight horizontal road. The driver hits the brakes. Um, the tires stop rotating. It skids. It stops. Constant acceleration the whole time. 
and we've got some skid marks on the road, which two of the following measurements taken together would allow a scientist to calculate the total mechanical energy dissipated during the skid. So again, we know that change in kinetic energy or kinetic uh, is work, network. We also know that work is force times distance. So that being said, if we know the distance over which the brakes act, which we could find maybe by using this. Notice this is a select two answers question, by the way. So here we've got a distance. We're also gonna need to know the force, which is gonna be the force of friction. And we can't calculate that force of friction without knowing the, um, the coefficient of friction. And it's gonna be kinetic friction since this thing is moving. So it's looking like D is our best answer here. So if we know um, the weight, which we do, and the coefficient of friction, and the distance over which that frictional force acts, we can calculate the work, which would give us the change in kinetic energy. So 31, we're gonna choose both C and D is our correct answers. Remember, on these select two choices, you have to get both of them correct to get any credit. So be careful on these. All right, so now we're at 32. Two satellites, they're identical to each other. They move through space at the same speed. They're acted on by the same net force. Satellite one, the net force acts in the opposite direction of the motion and causes it to slow down, but not stop. Satellite two, it acts in the same direction. For which satellite does the kinetic energy change by a greater magnitude? So this is still this change in kinetic energy equals work. Change in kinetic energy equals force times distance. Well, here's what we know. We know that this force is the same, but the distance isn't. Because remember that in satellite two, the force is acting in the same direction as the thing's moving, which means it's getting faster and faster and faster. And because it's getting faster and faster and faster, this force is acting over a greater distance for on satellite two than it is on satellite one. And since that's the case, the work done on satellite two is more than the work done on satellite one, which means satellite two is going to experience a, a much larger change in kinetic energy. And it's D that tells us that choice here. All right, that's it for our multiple choice questions. Um, make sure that you stick around and watch the video on the FRQ. Hope that helps. All right, so now let's take a look at the long free response question. Uh, we have a wheel rolling down an incline plane at angle theta above the ground. First thing we want to know is, or we want to do is indicate all the forces that act on this wheel. Essentially drawing almost like a free body diagram, but we want to show the forces at the points at which they act. So the first thing we're going to do is to draw in weight. We usually draw weight from the center, the center of mass, and weight acts straight down. We're going to label this as mg. We could also draw in a normal force. Remember, a normal force acts at 90 degree angles to the surface, and it's acting from the surface. So maybe something like that. We'll label that as n. And then the third and final force that we need to put in is the frictional force. Friction acts from the point of contact of the wheel and the plane, and it acts in the opposite direction of the motion. So maybe like so. So those are the only actual forces acting on the wheel. We don't show components. Second part wants to know which force causes a change in the angular velocity, so the speed at which it rotates. And the short answer to that is that the only, only force here that's uh, causing a torque causing a turn of the wheel is the frictional force. So the answer to two, frictional force is causing the torque. It's, it's um, causing the wheel to change its rotation. All right, so part B. For this ramp angle, 
the force of friction exerted on the wheel is less than the maximum possible static friction force. Instead, the magnitude of the force of static friction exerted on the wheel is 40% of the magnitude of the force or force component directed opposite to the force of friction. Derive an expression for the linear acceleration of the wheel center of mass in terms of m, theta, and physical constants as appropriate. Well, here's what we know. We know we've got this plane. Think of our wheel on the plane. We have a, a weight acting down. So let's draw this in as our weight. We're going to take that weight and break it into components. And we're going to do vector resolution on it. And we're going to break it into a component that we're going to call F parallel. And we'll call this component over here F perpendicular. This angle right here turns out to be the same as this angle right here because we have similar triangles. This angle is theta. Therefore, this angle right here, also theta. The part of the weight that's making the, the wheel go down the hill is the parallel component of that weight. And we could find that using sine. So we could say the sine theta is equal to F parallel. Well, in this case, our hypotenuse is our weight. So F parallel over mg, which means that F parallel is equal to mg sine theta. So let's think about the acceleration down this plane. To find the acceleration, we need to know the net force. So we could say that the uh, net force, write it this way, acting down the plane, is going to be equal to the parallel component of the weight, mg sine theta, minus the frictional force. So let's rewrite that a little bit different way down here. Because what they tell us is that the frictional force is 0.4 of the force acting opposite of friction. Well, that's this force, which means the frictional force is 0.4 times mg sine theta. All right, so we could do a little work on that. We could simplify this. And that means that the net force is equal to 0.6 mg sine theta. Well, that's the net force. We know that acceleration is equal to the net force, 0.6 mg sine theta, over the mass. So we could cancel out the masses. So our acceleration is 0.6 times g over sine theta. And that's your answer to part b. Finally, part c wants to know that if we started um, on an incline, we had a wheel on an incline, and then later on the same ramp, we had a block of ice. If these two objects, the wheel and the block of ice, started at the same height, we want to know... Um, which one reaches the bottom of the, the ramp with the greatest speed? There's a couple different ways you can answer this. One of them is that um, ice. We've got ice here. Ice is very slick, which means there's very little friction. So we could say the block of ice is going to make it to the bottom first because there's very little friction acting between it and the plane. Whereas the wheel, there's a little bit more friction. Um, so because there's more net force acting, um, acting on the, um, the block of ice, it will accelerate faster and therefore have a greater speed once it reaches the bottom of the plane. The other way to explain it is in terms of energy, and that's what part two wants us to look at. Um, all right, all right let's make even a bad assumption here. Let's say there was no friction here or here. For the wheel, the, potential, the gravitational potential energy that we started with at the top is eventually going to get converted to kinetic energy by the time it reaches the bottom. Some of that kinetic energy is going to be translational, linear. But that wheel is also going to spin. 
I'm going to use KT to mean translational kinetic energy. But because it's spinning, some of that kinetic energy is also rotational kinetic energy. Whereas with the block of ice, all the gravitational potential energy is going to be translational, straight line kinetic energy. Which means, with the wheel, some of the energy is going to go into making it move. Which means it's going to be moving slower than the block of ice. The block of ice, no matter which way you look at it, one or two, will make it to the bottom with a faster speed uh, than the wheel. Hope that helps.